In Luke chapter 11, when Jesus performed a miracle casting a demon out of someone, those who were witness to it said that he cast out that demon by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of the devil. And the Lord made a very profound statement, a lot of profound statements made by the Lord, but the Lord made a very profound statement as it relates to unity. He mentioned a tenet of unity, a law of unity. He said something about unity that is foundational to it. And that is, he cannot possibly be casting out demons by the power of the one who was over the demons. That would be working against the one who then sent him or the one by whom he is casting this out. And he said that every kingdom divided against itself will be brought to desolation. And this is true for any organization, this is true for any home, this is true for any institution. Anything that is divided against itself will be brought to desolation. It cannot stand. And so the critical nature of our topic at hand is certainly brought to the fore by that sentiment that Jesus expressed. If we are divided in ourselves, if we are divided in ourselves, amidst ourselves, in the brotherhood, in the church, then we cannot possibly stand. We cannot continue to stand because the kingdom divided in itself will be brought to desolation. If we continue to divide ourselves, we will only be doing ourselves great and serious harm. This is the law of unity, if you will. And we see this throughout the scriptures. We see that uh, spirit of divisiveness throughout the scriptures in various instances. One that may be more prominent on our minds, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, the, the Apostle Paul talks about the divisions that were taking place in Corinth based upon who had the best spiritual gifts and other things. And we see then that what division causes in the body. No doubt you've probably been uh, involved or heard about congregations where there were divisions, where there were things that were going on. And who benefits from division in the church? It's not the body that benefits. The members certainly don't benefit from division in the church. The only one who benefits from division in the body of Christ is Satan. Satan and his servants are the only ones who benefit when we divide ourselves, and in this case, with skin color. When we decide that we're going to, instead of being together, one brotherhood, we're going to be two, walking two straight lines, if you will, side by side, not necessarily being too mean to one another, but yet we will not get together. That is, by definition, segregation. In fact, that is how segregation was explained, at least to me, in the country in which I was reared. And so we understand that this unity, or disunity rather, is something that Satan prides himself on in causing in the church, in whatever form it will take. He will take what by, it by whatever means necessary. And so we ought not to be giving him the ammunition to divide the body of Christ, to divide us, especially based upon pigmentation. And so we see the serious nature of the study in which we are engaged. Unity cannot exist or cannot continue where there is division by its very nature. If we are not unified or if we do not come together in some form or fashion, we will destroy ourselves, the Lord said, because a kingdom divided against itself, it just cannot stand. And so we seek to address the subject of racism, and we talked about why it is that it is a hot-button issue. Why is it that some are uncomfortable with it? It's a hot-button issue because people are still, it is still very prevalent. It's very prevalent in our societies, in certain, in certain places more than others. It's very prevalent in the church, as we concluded. When you look out into the body of Christ, you can pretty much split us right down the middle, black over here and white over here. In any town, given town that you go into, you will find these two separated one from another, but yet claiming to be one or claiming to be one family under Christ. We understand that it is uncomfortable because some still have a problem with it. Some are dealing with this sin. Uh, and have not necessarily tackled it, have not necessarily sought to understand it. And so it becomes uncomfortable. We want you to move on, preacher. We want you to talk about something else. Why not go ahead and give us the gospel plan of salvation again? Anything 
but this subject. We also understand that it has not been talked about very widely because it is not profitable for those who seek to maintain a job, for those who may seek to maintain their coffers full of the, the don or uh, may seek to maintain their coffers uh, by means of the donors who are racist. And so we understand it's not very profitable for some to talk about this subject, but we talk about it. Why? Because it is a matter of righteousness. We want to discuss or have been discussing racism from three aspects. If it's in the congregation, and we will address the congregation and look at some identifying marks and look at some things that we can identify in our congregations that will help us to stop being racist or to keep us from being racist in, uh, or prejudiced or bigoted in our endeavors. But we looked at the individual. We have to start with the individual. If racism is in the Lord's church, then it was brought there by someone. As we looked at the history of the church, we understand that there was prejudice involved in, in, in the church from the very onset between the Jew and the Gentile. That is something that was a, a, a problem, and many things are written about that. And certainly, if you want to, you can go and look through all of the different things that are said about that, certainly germane to our topic here. But we understand that the, the individual needs to examine his or her own heart to make sure that they are not being prejudiced, that they are not being prejudiced in their actions, in their thoughts. And this, that's where we wanted to start because congregations are made up out of individuals. And so these individuals needed to understand that when they do such things, when they are prejudiced, when they are bigoted, when they are racist even, when they hate those of a different color, those who are not like them, even xenophobic, when they hate those who are not from the same country as them, if you will, there has been no transformation of the heart, we said. There's been no transformation of the heart because we understand that that type of mindset, it may very well be present and is present in the world, but once you come into Christ, that mindset must change. That mindset must die. In fact, when you go into the waters of baptism, the old man with its mindset and its ways and the things that it thought, that man should be put to death. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, but it certainly needs to happen. It cannot stay the same. And so when someone is still engaging in racism, bigotry, and prejudice, we understand that there's no, been no transformation of the heart, but then also there has been no comprehension of the Holy One. We understand God and who He is by a study of the Scriptures. We, we can learn God. But John says in 1 John 3, verses 11 through 15, that if we hate our brothers and sisters in Christ, then we don't know God. We don't know Him as we should. Because God is love, and there is no way for you to love God and hate your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so there is no comprehension of who God is when you're prejudiced, bigoted, or racist. You can't hate who God loves and expect to go to His heaven. You have to choose. You have to be prejudiced or paradise, or we want to go to paradise. You cannot have both. And so how do we overcome this sin in the lives? Uh, uh, how does someone overcome this sin in their lives? It's much like any other sin. There is a way to o overcome it. And we chose uh, the example set forth by, uh, uh, in the book of Acts, written by Luke in Acts chapter 8, verses 22 and 24, is the account of Simon the sorcerer desiring to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit because he thought it would be great for him to have that in his business. You remember he was a sorcerer. And so having the gift of the Holy Spirit, being able to perform all of those miracles, uh, certainly would bring him great profit. And Simon was rebuked by Peter and he was told to do a number of things. And those are the things that we looked at. Those are the things that we certainly want to encourage those who are struggling with the sin to do. Simon told him, you need to repent of this wickedness. We wanted to focus first and foremost on the idea of wickedness. Simon Peter was told that he is caught up in the gall of bitterness. He is in chains of, uh, is poisoned with bitterness and he is chained by iniquity. You are tethered to sin. And he was told that this thing that you, that you are engaging in is wickedness. It is a disposition that is vile and certainly prejudice. Certainly racism, certainly bigotry, xenophobia, you name it, whatever name you want to put to it. Uh, certainly those things are wicked and an abomination in the sight of God because there is no respect of persons with God. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 17 says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, 
the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. God does not show partiality. Did you know that God does not have any favorites? God does not play favorites, if you will. God does not have a section over here where He says, I love those people more than I love these people over here. You don't find that in the Scriptures. What you find is that there are people who are blessed by God because they are in His Son. Those blessings are not because of who they are, but because of who He is. Because He had conferred those blessings upon Him when they obeyed the gospel, when we obeyed the gospel. It doesn't mean that He loves the creation over here who is not in His Son any less. That He looks at them with disdain and says, You know what? I don't want anything to do with you. The Bible is clear. He wants them to be saved. He doesn't approve of their ways. He doesn't approve of their methods. It certainly is an abomination to Him, but He desires their salvation. God does not show partiality. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter opened his mouth in Cornelius' house, and he said, I, I, Of a truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. Whoever fears Him and works righteousness. Doesn't matter your skin color. Do you fear the Lord? Do you work righteousness? You can and will be accepted by God. God shows no partiality. And so the idea of us showing partiality, the idea of us being prejudiced is certainly contrary to who God is, to His very nature. And so we understand this concept that uh, God wants us to change from this wickedness or wants people to change from this wickedness. So Peter tells him that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. And if you continue on this trend, you too will die in your sins. You are tethered to sin. Those who are engaged in racism need to understand that you are tethered to sin. If you continue in this, regardless of whether you do it in private, regardless of whether it is deep in your heart, regardless if you've been able to fool those who are around you thinking you're an upstanding individual when deep down you really hate those who are of a different color, you are still tethered to sin. And that sin, if unrepented, will land you in the fires of hell. It's as simple as that. It's the law of sin and death. And so that's why Simon is being told to repent of those things, to turn from those things. And that's the same message that we have for the racist, the one who is prejudiced or bigoted. And so repent, and that means you need to change the way you think, but not just changing your actions. Sometimes there is a misconception here. This is the plight of man-made laws. The plight of or dilemma of man-made laws, generally speaking, it stops people from acting out their hearts, but it does not change the heart. The laws that have been put in place are certainly good. The laws that have stopped people from discriminating against others of a different skin color, those are good laws, and certainly we applaud those laws being put in place. But that does little for the changing of the heart. That's the dilemma with man-made laws. It can only go so far. God's laws on repentance necessitates a changing of the mind and a changing of the actions. So when Peter tells Simon to repent, he's not just asking him to stop what he's doing. He's asking him to change his mind about what he's doing. He's asking him to think differently. You want this gift to be able to elevate yourself, to make a profit. You need to change your mind about that. That's not right. And so we ask those who are prejudiced to change their mind about what they are doing. Some may very well have stopped making their racist jokes. They may sit side by side in the pew with the brethren and provide the occasional smile. Yet if the heart remains in a degenerate state, you are fooling everyone but God. It's easy to say, well, you know what, I've changed when the heart has not changed. That's not repentance. It requires both. One requires to do a change of the mind as well as a change of actions that will lead to a change of actions. We have to think differently. We have to think a different way when we talk about those who are needing to repent because of this prejudice. We need to have a proper estimation of God's creation. We talked about last week, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, clearly points out that we are the crown of God's creation. We are made in His image. Who? Everyone. Everyone. 
We're cut from the same cloth. If you were to trace to your ancestry, you know, they have these things, Ancestry.com and things like that, by which they gather all your information and DNA, right? And uh, they, you put it in and they'll tell you, well, you're from here and you're from here. Well, if you read the Bible, it'll tell you exactly where you're from. Make it all, you, when you trace your ancestry, you, let's say you are a Caucasian person, you are a white person or a Spanish person or a black person, and you trace your ancestry, guess what? All of you are going to come out at the same place. First of all, you're going to come out at the boat, at the ark, with Noah and his family. That's where you're going to end up. If you were to go through history and trace your ancestry, that's where you will all end up and find out well, we're all related. And if you go further than that, you're going to go to the tree. You're going to be right there with Adam and Eve, and you're going to find, well, these are our ancestors. These are the ones from whom we stem, from whom we came. We are all related because God has created us all. He's created us, starting obviously with Adam and Eve, and continued in Noah and his family when he destroyed the world. And so we have to have a proper estimation of God's creation. Those people who look different than I, cut from the same cloth. We come from the same God. But we also have to have that mindset in Christ, understanding that that brother who looks different than I, that sister who looks different than I in skin color, he was created, she was created in the same way that I was created. As a Christian in Christ, by obedience to the gospel, we are His workmanship, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us. But then we stop there, and we want to continue tonight by talking about having a proven disposition when drawing conclusions. First of all, the way we change our minds, repentance, stay with me here as far as Peter is concerned, what he's telling uh, Simon, you need to repent, change the way you think. Number one, having a proper estimation of God's creation. Number two, having a proven disposition when it comes to drawing conclusions. You know, we get most of our exercise, I would say, by jumping to conclusions. That's probably where we get most of our exercise. On various things. Just, you name it, we usually jump to conclusions. We're usually quick to draw a conclusion about something that we know nothing. And uh, we make assessments, we make speculations, and we say things, and we do things, and yet we do not have any evidence to the fact. But we say it, and we say it emphatically, and then we repeat it to others, which then becomes gossip. But this is especially true when it comes to people. We do this. We, we like to make assumptions about people without knowing people, and especially when it comes to race. The things we assume, the things we speculate, the things we wonder about are often graduated to fact without a shred of evidence. This mindset, the mindset of assuming or making judgments without the evidence, is the lifeblood of prejudice. It is the lifeblood of bigotry and racism. It is the thing that causes it to live, if you will. In fact, this is literally the definition of prejudice. Prejudice towards pre-judging. That's what prejudice is. That's what racism is stemmed upon, a preconceived judgment or opinion. And so assuming something without the fact is not only foolishness, it is also unrighteous. This is not how we are supposed to make discernments about anything, about anything, let alone people, let alone those who are members of the body of Christ, let alone others who are even out there in the world. Our discernment or judgment is guided by one principle. Jesus mentioned this principle. I want to look at that in its context and make application as we look at this idea of racism and rooting it out. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath. He does this, obviously, because he is the Christ. And John chapter 5, verse 16 says, For this reason, because he healed a man on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Now, when opportunity presented itself, and some scholars say it's a year later, uh, Jesus exposed the mindset of those who wanted to kill him, and still do, because he healed the man on the Sabbath. He exposes their mindset. Read it with me. John chapter 7 from verses 19 through 24. John chapter 7 
verses 19 through 24. Remember, they want to kill Jesus. They've been wanting to kill him. It's been about a year since he, he healed that man on the Sabbath. And now he is, he is at the Feast of Tents, Feast of Booths. He's in the temple. He's speaking, and he's going to say some things uh, to them. He gets up into the front of the people, and he says the following in verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered, You have a demon. You're crazy. Who is seeking to kill you? Right? They may have forgotten, because it's been a while, but Jesus did not forget. They were still seeking to kill him. There were still those out there who were seeking to destroy him. He says, You're seeking to kill me. They said, We're not trying to kill you. They're trying to deny this. Jesus answered and said to them, verse 21, I did one work, heal the man on the Sabbath. And you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, I want you to keep that phraseology in mind. If a man receives circumcision, the Lord uses that phraseology, receives circumcision, because circumcision is something that was done for an individual. If you receive circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Circumcision was not so much about the act as it was the purpose behind the act. Understanding the Hebrew history, and God made this covenant with, with Abraham that the males would be circumcised on the eighth day. The circumcision, they received uh, the circumcision on the, uh, the, on the Sabbath. Circumcision was something that was done for them. The circumcision uh, had to do with the promises associated with what God made to Abraham. It was a show of the covenant relationship in which they were. It symbolized the blessings and the privileges they had from God under the Mosaic economy. That's what the circumcision was about. It was not just about that physical act. It was actually about the things connected to it. It was done for the male Jew, and it was done even on the Sabbath something that they received on that Sabbath. Jesus was doing the very same thing. Now, wait a second. He wasn't circumcising someone. He was healing someone. He was making someone well. Exactly. That's Jesus' point. He was conferring a blessing. He was giving something to that individual that was good, something that was compassionate. He was showing compassion to the one in need on the Sabbath, and you know what, that's okay. He was allowed to do that. The law didn't say that he couldn't do that because he puts him doing good to that individual on the same plane as the good done by way of circumcision. You received something by circumcision. You received good by circumcision, entered into that covenant. It's a sign of the promises. What I've done is exactly the same thing. I've given something that was good something that was in my power to do, certainly something that was in the law to do. But they did not see it that way. All they saw was a man they hated. Jesus did something, and instead of them looking at the action that Jesus did and making a proper investigation of the law and saying, wait a second, let me see whether what this person is saying is indeed the truth or what Jesus did. Let me see if, we can, if, if he can actually do that. Let me search the scriptures. No, that's not what they did. Jesus performed the miracle. They hated him. And so they said, you know what? You're wrong. You're sinning and doing this. You're just a Sabbath breaker. That's all you are. If they investigated the law, they would not find these actions unlawful at all. And that's Jesus' point. If they had spent the time looking into the law, they would not find him to be a lawbreaker. They judged, therefore, according to appearance. They judged on the surface. They looked at his actions and never investigated. They made a conclusion and drew, draw, drew a conclusion, and they said that man was a sinner. And Jesus says, you need to stop it. You need to stop it. Because you 
are being hypocrites. You didn't say Moses was being a sinner when he commanded you to do that. You continue to do that even on the Sabbath, and I'm doing the very same thing. But it's because you want to kill me, as he started off. It's because you don't like me. And so he tells them to search the Scriptures before you make judgments about right and wrong. That principle ought to be applied in every facet of pure Christianity. That principle ought to be applied in every facet of life, but especially doctrine, especially the things that we talk about in the, in the body of Christ. Before you assert someone is preaching false doctrine, you might want to check to see whether they are preaching false doctrine, lest you end up in the same disposition as the Jews. Before we assert something, we need to investigate, is Jesus' point. When it comes to prejudice, some are exhibiting the same spirit as the Jews who try to kill Jesus. When you draw a conclusion about someone without a shred of evidence, without the truth supporting and sustaining it based upon their skin color, it is, your conclusion, is unfounded and it is unrighteous. And it is certainly foolish. We, all of us, not just those who deal with this problem, but generally speaking, we ought not to think that way about people. We ought not to think that way about anyone. We ought not to make surface judgments. We ought not to make broad assertions and emphatic assertions about individuals whom we know nothing, about whom we know nothing. When you see a black person, what do you think? Black person's walking towards you, what do you think? Since we're talking about racism, we want to look deep within ourselves. We're still talking about the individual changing the way he thinks. What do you think? What goes through your mind? Do you think criminal? Better clutch my purse. Better start walking to the other side of the road. Do you think inferior? Do you think that, well, I am better than that individual? What goes through your mind? Usually when we see someone and we see the way they're, even the way they're dressed, and we see the, the uh, you know, how they're walking, we see their skin color, and we, we make or draw conclusions about the individual. And those conclusions are very superficial because we don't know the individual. But that's prejudice. That's, 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 that's a prejudice that comes to the fore. Won't call it racism necessarily, but that is a prejudice that comes to the fore. What about a white person? When you see a white person, especially in today's society, they're racist, right? When you see someone who is Caucasian, must be racist. Because that's what the world is telling us. Everyone who has that skin color is racist. That's just as wrong. That's just as foolish. It's just as unrighteous because the assessment is still made based upon someone's skin color. When you see a Spanish person, what do you think? That person's probably here illegally, right? Immigrant, right? That assessment is also unfounded. It's based upon something that you don't know. You don't even know the person. You don't know whether the person may have grown up here, be an American citizen or something of that nature. But that's how we think, if we're honest with ourselves. That is how we view people, especially when it comes to skin color, especially when it comes to ethnicity. We already have our conclusions. We already have our, our estimations about individuals already made up for us neatly by the world. And they told us what to think. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. They've told us what to think. And so when we see these individuals, we immediately then draw the conclusion that is based upon what? Speculation. That is certainly not based upon the truth. Terms like, I know what they are like, is not only wrong, it's a lie, because you don't know. You can speculate. Your preconceived views have you speculating and painting with broad brushes. If you don't know the person, stop yourself from assuming what they are like. If you don't know the individual, it doesn't matter who they are, stop assuming that you know what type of individual they are. People look at me, I always joke about this. People look at me and they probably assume, they say, they say do you play basketball? 
because I'm black. Apparently, all black people play basketball. I couldn't play basketball to save my life. Didn't grow up with it. I don't play basketball. I don't even really care much for basketball. I'd rather watch some football. But that's the assumption, right? And as... What is the word I'm looking for? As benign as that is, as something that is not necessarily meant with ill intent, what I'm drawing, the, what I'm draw, I want to draw your attention to is that's how we think. We immediately assume something of someone without even knowing them. And the best course of action for us is, let's just stop it. Let's just try to get to know people for who they are. We might learn something about them that we didn't know. We might learn that we have more in common with one another than we have differences from one another. And so Peter tells Simon, you need to repent, you need to change the way you think, and that's what we want to encourage those who are dealing with prejudice or racism or bigotry. You need to change the way you think. You need to have a proper estimation of God's creation. You need to have a proven disposition about drawing conclusions, but then also repentance does require action. And so you need to have a pattern of righteous actions. Simon was to do more than just change his mind. He had to change his ways. When you change your mind, you change your ways. If racism, prejudice, or bigotry is a problem in your life, there are no doubt things in your life that you've said and done that were a result of those sins. Because we act what is in the heart. Luke chapter 6 and verse 45, Out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. And so there's certainly things that we may have done or certainly things that we do that facilitates that prejudice, that facilitates that racism. You can't just think differently. You have to act differently. Now, don't try to overcomplicate this thing when it comes to the how. Don't try to come up with all sorts of things that you now must do. I see the world, uh, apparently, white people have to kneel. Brethren, let me just say, as a side note, that is the most horrendous thing and the most... I feel sorry for those people who have done it and for those who believe that they now have to kneel because they are... That is absolutely unbiblical. It is not biblical because certainly if you're not guilty of something you have no need to repent. Everyone needs to examine their hearts. Everyone needs to make sure that they are right with the Lord. But if you're not racist, if you have nothing to repent of, then certainly, or if you're not guilty of that, you have nothing to repent of. And the idea that everyone has to do that is certainly not a biblical idea. So stop promoting it and stop saying it or stop asking our white brethren, if you will, uh, stop posting it online and saying that's what people have to do. I see a lot of people telling people that all of a sudden you now need to admit that you're racist. If you are not racist, if your actions are in line with the Scriptures, then certainly preach against racism, teach against racism, but you certainly don't need to repent because repentance is for those who are guilty of sin. And so please let that be noted. Don't try to overcomplicate this thing when it comes to how to change your mind about racism. Don't try to overcomplicate this thing as about how we're going to get you, you, how you're going to change your actions. Think about it in terms like this. It's a sin just like any other sin. The alcoholic, probably not going to go work in a bar. Not a good idea for the alcoholic to go work in the bar and to be surrounding himself with all of those things that can certainly draw him back into that. Shouldn't be working in a bar to begin with as a Christian. What about the thief or somebody who likes to keep his hands or put his hands on other people's money? Probably ought not to be the treasurer. Probably ought not to go work in a bank, right? Why? Because there's certainly a great temptation there, and that is the principle we want to apply here. There are certain things that lend itself to racism. There are certain things that lend itself to prejudice. And so it will be different for every person. The things that you do, the places that you go, The company that you keep, very important. If you're going to change your mind and you're going to change your actions, you may have to or will have to stop hanging around those guys who are constantly being racist, who are constantly saying things that are contrary to the Scriptures about others of a different color. You need to separate yourself from them. 
You're going to have to do things differently. You may have to stop allowing or will have to stop allowing racist rhetoric to enter into your heart. There's a lot of people spewing racism on both sides, black and white. You need to stop letting those things enter into your heart. You need to turn off, if you will, and say, I'm not listening to you anymore. You have to change your ways because those are not your people. And what they're saying is certainly not the doctrine you ought to be following. Your people, if you look around you in the body of Christ, those are your people. And the doctrine and things that you need to be listening to is found in the Scriptures. You will have to change what you do and how you do things if you know that those things are the things that usually facilitate. The friends I keep, the things I listen to, the the places I go, those are all things that facilitate racism. Peter says, Simon, you need to repent And this is what you need to do if prejudice is present in your heart. You need to repent. Change the way you think and then change your actions. Start living differently. Like I said, it's going to be different for everyone. But number two, consider what Simon tells Peter. uh, Peter tells Simon, he says, you need to pray for forgiveness. Pray for forgiveness. Prejudice is a sin. But it is not an unforgivable sin. Simon was urged to approach the Father for mercy. Pray to God that He may forgive this wickedness of your heart. Excuse me. Now is not the time for you to harden your heart with pride. If you know you have prejudice in your life, now is not the time to be proud and say you're not going to... Pride is what got you here. Believing yourself to be better than another. Now is not the time to continue in that. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Admit the wrong and ask for His forgiveness. Say, I I was wrong. I did wrong. I ought not to have thought that way. I have not to have said those things. I have not to have done those things. I treated my brethren unfairly. I've judged them according to appearance and not righteous judgment. I have made broad assertions about them that were not true. Ask God's forgiveness. And don't you know He'll give it? That's the beauty of being a Christian. That's the beauty of the compassion of the Father. 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, notice what it says. He is faithful. He is faithful is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. He will always forgive those who willingly and who sincerely repent of their sins. He's faithful. He's going to do that. You don't have to worry that He's not going to do that for you. But you don't understand there's some deep hatred in my heart that I've harbored for a very long time. You need to work through that and get over that. You need to make sure that you overcome that, but know that God can and will forgive that if you repent. Don't be like Cain. When he was in the wrong, instead of repenting and doing what is right, he got upset. He got upset with God when he made the wrong offering. Imagine that. God says, why are you angry, Cain? You're the one who made the wrong offering. If anyone ought to be angry, it it, it ought to be me, if you will. But he's angry. Goes on to murder his brother. Don't be like that. Don't be like Cain. A lot of brethren are probably upset right now because the subject has come up again. A lot of brethren are squirming in their seats. They don't like to talk about this because they're racist. They, they've got racist tendencies. They've got racist people in their congregations. They've got racist friends. They, they're upset. They want you to move on. I hope that we don't. I pray that we don't. Because this is as much a problem and a tenet of Scripture as anything else. Don't get upset. Get right. Ask God's forgiveness during this time. Number three, he says, you need to repent, you need to pray for forgiveness, but then also what you can do is you need to ask for prayers. This is where those who are not guilty of prejudice can be of great assistance. Simon recognizing his fault solicits the prayer 
of Peter on his behalf. Pray for me. Brethren, don't shun this brother or sister. We do a very great job of burying our living. We do a great job when someone is in sin of casting them down instead of bringing them up and out of that sin. I've seen it firsthand in the Lord's church. It breaks my heart. But that's what happens. I heard of an instance where uh, uh, someone had told me of an instance where a lady who was struggling with uh, same-sex attraction came out and said, listen, I'm struggling with it. She's married. She's struggling with it. Member of the body of Christ. And what the brethren did is they wrapped her, their arms around her and said, we'll help you through this. We know there's no temptation taking you, but such a no, that's not what they did. Crucified her, according to what this individual told me. And how many times have you seen that happen in the body? If we want to fix the problem, we ought not to crucify these individuals who are trying to get right, who are trying to get out of this sin, who are trying to live better and do right. We need to help them. If they approach us and say, listen, I have a problem with prejudice in my life, I, I re we need to pray for them. We need to wrap our arms around them and we need to thank God that someone had the mind of the prodigal to come back to the Father and do that which is right, not bury them or crucify them. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass, prejudice would be, fall under that, right? You who are spiritual, who are in the right relationship with God, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Who's going to bring you back? Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Sin is a burden. Sin is a burden on individuals. And when they come and say, listen, we have a problem with sin, we don't heap on that burden. We try to help them bear that. We try to help them get over that. Nothing says I care about you more than appealing to the highest power on behalf of another. Nothing. Nothing says I care about you more and says tonight I'll pray for you. I'll go to my God who is most powerful with whom all things are possible and I will take your name before Him. That is care. Genuine, considerate care. This is wickedness, prejudice, racism. So repent. Ask for God's mercy and seek the prayers of others. That's what you can do if you are guilty of racism, prejudice, or bigotry. There's certainly hope, but there must be change if there ought to continue to be hope. Now, what can we do for those brethren? What can we do to and for those brethren? Those of us who understand that we are not racist, those of us who, who are against racism, white and black, what can we do to facilitate, to make sure that individuals like these are helped or stopped, either one? I think this is where the problem of prejudice is compounded in the body. Because we do nothing. We pretend it's not there. We assign excuses to people's prejudices. In our congregations, we know their prejudice. We know sister so-and-so, she just can't stand black people. And we know she's prejudiced. We know the elders, they, they, listen, there is a problem there because uh, we have a, a, a lot of uh, people that are in our communities, uh, you know, people of color, but we've never reached out to them. We only go to those who look like us. That's a problem in many areas. What do we do? We make excuses. They are from a different time, we say. They're from a different time. Well, they need to get with the times. Because their different time was wrong too. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. That's just the way he or she is. They need to change because that's not the way God wants them to be. That's not an excuse. Well, just ignore her uh, you know, or just ignore him. They're misguided. They're ignorant. Well, that is not a good excuse, nor is it a biblical excuse. We do not ignore sin. We do not sweep it under the rug. Tolerance and compromise is easily disguised as patience as well. We just have to be patient with these individuals. There's a lot of patience in the brotherhood, a lot of patience for sin, 
a lot of patience to allow people to continue in unscriptural relationships. We just have to be patient. We just have to allow them to continue in unscriptural relationships until they one day decide that it's okay for them to come out of it and let's not preach on it just so that we don't upset them. There's a lot of that going on. And certainly we need to stop that as well. But if we see someone who is caught in sin, someone who does not want to give up their sin, the Bible certainly tells us what to do about that. What can we do in our lives to not promote prejudice amongst these individuals? Number one, and we'll close with this, don't tolerate prejudice in your presence. Don't tolerate prejudice in your presence. Suffocate it. Suffocate it wherever you are. I remember working for the city back in South Africa in Cape Town, working for the water department. And I worked with fellows of the lewd fellows of the baser sort, if you allow me to use Paul's phraseology. Uh, I think it was Paul. And these individuals, they were, oh, their mouths ran through the earth. They were, spoke wickedly, they, they did wickedly. Things, listen, I want to get at, they were bad people. If I'm going to say bad, they were bad people, people that you don't necessarily want to hang out with, but I had to work with them. But they quickly got the picture that I would not stand as a Christian for their nonsense. When I cut off conversations, when I walked away, when I said, I don't want anything to do with that, when I called them out and said, well, that was wrong, they quickly understood that their actions would not be tolerated when I am there. And so what did they do? They, usually when I'm in the company, they would either stop what they're doing or they would walk away. And that's just a minor example of things that you may very well have experienced in your own work. The same goes for prejudice. That's what we need to do. When we hear our brethren making prejudice jokes or saying prejudice things, stop it right there. Say we won't tolerate it. We're not going to do that. Don't tolerate and don't take for granted what people know about you if you don't reveal anything about you. Those with whom you work, those with whom you socialize, the body of Christ needs to know that prejudices will not be tolerated in your presence. Those jokes will not be laughed at and those comments will not be entertained. That's what we can do. Not only don't tolerate prejudice in your presence, don't turn a blind eye to prejudice in your presence. When Peter made himself guilty of being uh, prejudiced and Paul saw that he did it, he just shook his head and said, Phew, I can't believe Peter did that and just went about his way. No, that's not what he did. He said, I would stood him to the face. Why? Because he was leading others away as well. And that's what prejudice is. It is a pernicious problem, a problem that will lead others away. I do not believe our inability to stand against prejudice in the Lord's church has so much to do with that specific sin as much it is as it has to do with our moral cowardice. Let me say that again. With our moral cowardice. We, for the most part, do not like to address sin. For the most part, sin has been allowed to do whatever it wants in our congregation, and prejudice is no different. Sin has been allowed to run rampant in some of our congregations. And those who claim to be righteous have sat there and said, well, what can we do? What can we do? We're just one person. Shrugged their shoulders and said, there's absolutely nothing that we can do. If we are serious about overcoming the problem, we have to be prepared to deal with the consequences. When you speak out against sin, problems are going to arise because people who are in sin don't want you to speak out about their sin. Ask any preacher who's worth his salt, who has preached against sin, and he knows there are people in the congregation who don't like it. You'll hear about it. If you have stood against sin, you know people don't like it. And so we have to be prepared for the consequences. When we stand up and say prejudice will not be tolerated, we need to be prepared for those consequences. We cannot sweep this under the rug. Speaking the truth has never been popular among those who prefer a lie. And so we cannot sweep this thing under the rug. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20 applies, brethren. It applies to more than just marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It applies to this as well. It applies to those brethren who make themselves guilty of prejudice, racism, and bigotry. That's the individual in the congregation. We have to start with ourselves. We have to do some introspection. I have to look at my life 
Are there any signs that this is a sin present in my heart? If so, it has to go. I have to see the, go see the great physician, Jesus the Christ, and let him cut it out before it kills my soul. That's what I need to do. And that's what I encourage you to do as we continue to study this lesson. You may have heard some things that you don't, that you don't necessarily like. You may have heard some things that causes, rubs you the wrong way. You may be uncomfortable about some things. Be uncomfortable. If you are prejudiced, I hope that you're uncomfortable. I hope that you continue to be uncomfortable until you reach that pig pen and realize that you can't stay there. You have to get back to your father's house. I thank you so much for your attention. We'll come back next week and we'll look at the home. Why prejudice is allowed or how prejudice comes into the home. And then also we will finish with the congregation. How can we identify it in the congregation? And what can we do to make sure that our future, the future, our children and the future can be better as we go forward? Because certainly, as we've said from the onset, it is possible to root it out. Why? Because God said so. Because these things ought not to be named among us. It certainly ought not to be the general practice. So once again, thank you for your attention. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, if you did not understand something, if you thought I said something that you do not agree with and you want to talk to me about it, certainly feel free to write me an email. My email is mornaystephanis, first and last name at gmail.com. Or send a message to on our Facebook page. We would certainly entertain those comments and those concerns that you may have. Once again, I hope you have a good night. Hope you have a good rest of your week. We will meet here again on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And we will certainly stream that lesson as well. If you're in the area and you're able to visit, please come and say hi. Thank you and God bless.